I'm Gordon Buchanan. I've spent years tracking down the world's top predators. I know how they act, and I've rarely felt threatened before. But now, there's a deadly difference. Animals that used to chase game are hunting humans. These are some of nature's biggest mysteries. To solve them, I'll put myself onto the trail of the managers. I'm in Nepal in search of a serial killer. A tigress that's killed at least 10 people in the last four years. Her name is Ungarapothi, which means the claw. This morning I'm heading to Chitwan National Park. This one is buying the tickets for the bus journey. The park is home to around 125 of Nepal's Bengal tigers. It's also home to Ungarapothi. So I'm on my way. Best, Chitwan National Park is seven hours away by bus. I think it's going to be a pretty long journey. 45 minutes outside Kathmandu and we've just hit this huge traffic jam. slight problem and this is a different bus because in the traffic jam um seemed to be taking forever so we, we got out and had a cup of tea it seemed the right thing to do at the time but then the traffic started moving we thought it'll only move 10 15 yards and it's moved maybe about 10 or 15 miles so just hopped on this bus and hoping that this bus is moving faster than our bus and we can be reunited with our bags and our passports I'm not sure whether things have got better or worse. Our bus stopped in front of us, so we got off one bus to run and catch up with our own bus, but we didn't quite make it. Finally, I'm reunited with my original bus and my cameras. I'm heading for the Terai, the hot lowlands of Nepal, on the border with India. In the past, tigers roamed this whole region. Nepal was once home to some of the highest densities of tigers on the Indian subcontinent. Like elsewhere in Asia, tigers have long been a sacred symbol here. But where they are revered, they're also feared. It's estimated there could be fewer than 200 Bengal tigers left in Nepal. Just look out at this landscape. There's not a square inch of this that hasn't been touched by the hand of man. At one time, not that long ago, this would have been thick jungle. It would have been a home for the tiger. Today, this is a place where tigers can't live. During the 1950s, a government program moved thousands of new people into this area of southern Nepal, and the forests were replaced by farmland. As the human population grew, the number of tigers fell. In 1973, the Nepalese government established Chitwan National Park to try and save the country's tiger population. And after several dusty hours by bus, I finally arrived here. At almost 1,000 square kilometers, Chitwan seems like ideal tiger territory. It looks amazing, it smells amazing and you'd think that tigers living somewhere like this there'd be no controversy no conflict but since the 1970s since Chitwan first opened 103 people have been killed by tigers the most recent death was just a year ago something unusual is happening in Chitwan within minutes of arriving I'm under attack from a rogue wild elephant nicknamed Valentino Valentino has killed two men in the last year. It seems it's not just the tigers that pose a threat to people here.
My guide in Chetuan is Dan Bahadur. He's been a tiger tracker here since the park first opened and has more than 40 years experience. Can't tell whether he's in love or whether he's annoyed. During his career, Dan has been involved in capturing man-eating tigers, and he's witnessed the carnage firsthand. I've seen actually the tigers the dragging humans. You body, are kidding me! But the human body was eaten half. Half. Uh -huh. the tiger was there. He was very angry with us. Mm -hmm. He came like. Aah! I climb up the tree. It's about 40 feet. You just look back there. I say, ah. keep eating. I start licking the body, and he's tearing off flesh, chewing all the bone like oh, we're shit. chewing like carrot. Yeah. yeah, very crunchy. I was so scared, and I feel every second my tree is getting one foot shot, <laughs> <laughs> dropping all the time. You know. <laughs> I can't imagine being so close to a man-eating tiger, and Chitwan's current man-eater, the claw, is somewhere in this park right now. I've filmed tigers before yeah. in India and in Russia mm -hmm. and in Bhutan, yeah. but this is the first place that I've come to where there is a problem with man-eating, where there is a tiger that is yeah. recently killed and eaten someone. Yeah. It just makes me think very differently about these, these tigers in this place. Humans are not natural prey for tigers. There must be a reason why some of the tigers in Chitwan, including in Garapothi, are behaving unnaturally and hunting people. And in Garapothi, has got very good at it. Every single man-eating attack is a tragedy for the human victim and their family. But conflict with humans rarely ends well for the tiger either. Sadly, the first tiger I'm going to see in Chitwan is not roaming free in the park. tiger in there, the two years old, young male, and he's a problem tiger, and that's why he's been locked up. He got injured by an older, bigger tiger, and then resorted to killing livestock. The short-term good news for this tiger is that once its wound is healed, they're going to re-release it into Chitwan. But that doesn't mean to say that it's not going to stay a problem tiger. It doesn't mean to say that it's not going to become a man-eater. And if it moves back out and gets the same pressures, push it out into the human landscape, you know, what are the options? It could get poisoned and you'd never know about it. It could get shot or it could be locked up like this. This tiger is not a man-eater yet, but who knows what the future holds. I'm heading to a village called Bagadi. It's outside the national park, but it is just on the edge of Ngarapothi's territory. These villagers live right on the edges of the park. They often stray into tiger territory, either cutting grass to feed livestock or catching fish to feed their families. Garapothi killed this man's son. At the time of the attack, his son was fishing in the river with a friend. It's just the stuff of nightmares. These two men were on the river here, just going about their business alongside the bank, and suddenly one man hears a noise and looks behind him and he sees his friend his companion being dragged off 
into the grass by Ngarapothi, this man-eating tiger, the tiger that had actually killed before. When the claw attacked, his son's friend tried to raise the alarm. He panics and comes out into the middle of the river and floats down and manages to get back to the village. And he gets 40 people and they all come here making lots of noise and they manage to scare the tiger off, but it was way, way too late. The, the man was already dead and his son was, was dead. What's even more disturbing is what happened to the other man in the boat. Where is the, where's the man now? He's died. He died from this scare, I think, it's kind of... Really? Yeah. How, how old was he? Yeah, 30. God. Yeah, same age. They're probably both the same friend. God. Yeah. Imagine dying from, well, being killed by a tiger, but being killed by the fear of a tiger. I think that's of... You know, that's even more horrible than the actual, the, the, the man that was, that was killed. The fact yeah, that yeah, just the terror yeah, of living alongside a predator like a tiger that can, it can actually kill you, that fear can kill you. It's clear this place is unlike anywhere I've been before. And for me to understand why this tigress has turned serial man-eater, I need to enter the Claw's hunting grounds myself. In the early hours, we set off for the northwest of the park to take a look at Ngara Pothi's home territory. Oh. Travelling on elephant back is the best way to avoid spooking the wildlife. In the heart of the park, the deer are not the only animals up and about. We soon come across something hiding in the tall grass. Ngarapothi, and he's feeding on a recent kill. Tigers really are the top cat in this, this area. They've got such supreme confidence. And the only good thing that you have is human beings and other tigers. This tiger seems to be thriving. He's in the prime of health and looks like he has plenty of natural prey. What is different about the claw? What makes her hunt humans? Just on the other side of the river here is Bandarjola Island, which is the, the home territory to Nangana Posse. I want to go over onto the island just to get a feel for this tigress, a feel for where she, where she lives. I'm keeping my camera with me just in case I get lucky. The chances of actually seeing Angarapothi for myself are slim. No one has caught sight of her for over a year. If I can film an image of her, perhaps her appearance will unlock the mystery of why she's turned man-eater. We soon find some fresh tracks. And Garapothi's distinctive pug marks are unmistakable. That's the one we're looking for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. See, that's the animal. They're how she got her name, the claw. 
when a tiger kills a person, you want to identify which tiger it is. And if you can't see the tiger, all you've got to go on the signs that it leaves behind. And with Ungarapothi, she's got a very distinctive spacing between these two toes. Um, I haven't seen any tiger tracks with that sort of that kind of spacing. So three or four days ago, she's walked down the edge of this forest, uh, and right now she's just, she's in there somewhere. And that's where we're heading now. Almost stood on it. <laughs> It feels pretty unnerving to walk into the home of a known serial killer. Most people who see Ngarapothi don't live to tell the tale. If she attacks, I'll have little chance of survival. You just never know where an attack is going to come from. Tigers stalk their prey silently, staying hidden until the very last moment, when they explode in a gap-closing rush. The victim is usually dispatched with a killer bite to the neck. here against something as as perfect as a tiger we are nothing and you're right to be scared of a tiger you're right to be scared of any animal that's bigger and more powerful than you but the thing that is truly terrifying about this animal is that she's out there and she hears my voice she doesn't have the normal fear that a, a normal tiger would have she's hearing what could be a potential next meal this is a tigress that hears humans and thinks of food. I'm going to set up a camera trap here to see if we can capture Ungara Pothi on film. The reason I'm putting this camera trap here is there's actually an old set of tracks here. So at some point, fairly recently, tiger has walked down here so if you imagine the tiger coming from the island when it gets to the river like this maybe has a scan up down and makes up its mind whether it's gonna have a better chance of finding food that way or this way it's unsettling being here in the claws home territory I feel like Ngarapothi is watching me as if she knows I'm trying to find her. Is the air conditioning working? Ngarapothi is Chitwan's most recent man-eater. But she's not the only serial killer to have prowled this park. We're on our way to a place called Temple Tiger. About four years ago, it was the scene of a horrific man-eating attack. So we're heading down there just to try and find out a little bit more about it. At least 36 different tigers have made attacks on people in Chitwan in just 25 years. I'm hoping there may be clues in these other attacks that can explain what has turned the claw into a serial killer. This man, what's, what's your name? Gordon. Uh, man. Man. Yeah. <laughs> man, I'll remember that. In some ways, you have to admire the confidence of the tiger. There's buildings on that side, buildings here, lots of noise, and it wasn't remotely scared. The victim was one of a team of elephant keepers. The tiger was there, in I think embossing or something. Uh -huh. The tiger was there, he walked through this way, and the tiger jumped. Just grabbed him. And grabbed him. Yeah, he was the last in a row of four. Three of them had already crossed this path and they were the lucky ones because absolutely guaranteed the tiger was in the grass just here watching, watching one man come down and you have to enter the mind of the man-eater. What's he thinking? And he just sees one animal walk past, one big moving lump of meat. Another guy walks past a third guy walks past, and by this time, this man-eater is sitting here and it's made up his mind. The next person to come along, he's going to go for him. 
and unfortunately, the fourth guy just got grabbed. They found a drag mark, spots of blood, his flip-flop, and he was killed instantly by this tiger. Like Ngarapothi, this tiger claimed many human lives. This was his fourth victim, and he clearly regarded the man as food. When the other keepers challenged the tiger on elephant back, he wouldn't give up the body. Just completely, they're completely decapitated. When a tiger turns serial man killer, the authorities are permitted to remove or kill the animal. After this attack, the park staff finally tracked the tiger down and shot him dead. Looking at this tiger, I think possibly what has happened is that this is a young male that's been kicked out by his mother. He is wandering around Chitwan looking for a place of his own, looking for his own home. He's getting pressured by other tigers. Bigger males than him are telling him to move on. Mature females are pushing him out. And what happens, a tiger that is on the move constantly can build up an idea of where to get food. So you've got this desperate young male looking around Every day he's getting more and more hungry and finally he makes that decision. He makes that decision to become a man-eater. A tiger with no territory has nowhere to hunt for its food. And a very hungry tiger might be forced into unnatural predatory behaviour. Is this what happened to the claw? Perhaps a younger tiger was infringing on her territory, making it more difficult for her to survive. Are there too many tigers in Chitwan and not enough space? The person to ask is Bim Gurung, a tiger specialist who spent more than 10 years researching the man-eating cases in Chitwan. Since uh, early 1980s, uh, we uh, estimated that the Chitwan population, tiger population, has stabilized okay. because of their territorial yeah. nature. Although tiger numbers have been stable here, human kills have increased dramatically especially since 1997. This map shows the human being killed prior to 97 okay. and then after 97. Right. So these white dots are prior to okay. 97, which is not that many. So that is our data of 19 years. Yeah. And how many people since 97 have been killed? Yeah, since 97 we have uh, 65 Gosh. Uh, people were killed till 2006. Okay. When you suddenly uh, see in Chitwan that there's a dramatic increase uh, you know, between after like 97, then you are concerned like, why is that okay. happening? I mean, is the tiger like changing their behavior uh -huh. or, you know, it's an evolutionary process okay. or something? Bim discovered that in 1996, the government established buffer zones. Degraded stretches of land along the edges of the park were earmarked for renewal. In these buffer zones, the growing human population can gather firewood, but not chop down the trees. The aim was to improve the forest, and it worked. So, the park is on this side, buffer zone's this side. You know, there's, there's no difference, other than this, this track here. Yeah, this is a Mardi road, yeah. uh, boundary line for the National Park and the buffer zone community forest. Yeah. And there's no difference for tigers. Yeah, you think of a map, and there's a line on a map, that's just for people. Yeah, it's just And for any, any wild animal in this area is, is not going to differentiate between this side of the road and this side of the road. No. Um, and certainly no tiger is going to know this is where we would like you to be and this is where we right. don't want you to come. So the tigers moved into the buffer zones and closer to people. The real problem is, is that Chitwan is at capacity. Chitwan's producing more tigers than it can cope with. And where do they go? Well, they start heading this way. They come to this road and think, OK, there's no tigers here. Maybe I can eke out a living here. But the trouble is, in this buffer zone, that's where people are utilising the forest. Tigers that are in here become accustomed to people and maybe they start to lose the fear of people. Tigers may be driven into the buffer zone because of overcrowding in the park. But that doesn't explain what's turned them and the claw into man-eaters. There must be more to it than simply sharing space. To find out more, I'm heading to the village of Soraha. It's on the northeastern edge of the park and inside the buffer zone. The buffer zone took in all the land up to five kilometers from the park border. 
This included forest, agricultural land and villages. Here, a tiger with no fear of man went beyond a chance encounter in the forest and actually entered the village. Okay, is this the place? Yeah, that's the house. Ah, so you just walk in Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Namaste. Namaste. She's the wife of the victim. Okay. I want to find out exactly what happened. You know, back in 2004, but just sort of as much detail as we can. It, there was there was a buffalo ki ox a goru ki ranga ranga the buffalo male was tied here. Okay. So the tiger came and killed that buffalo. Right. So when the man heard the noise, he came to find out in the dark uh -huh. what it is, and it was a tiger. Okay. The buffalo is tied onto this rope here. Probably at that point, the people that were in the building wouldn't have heard a single thing. It would have been a very quick, almost silent process. But when the tiger starts trying to drag the buffalo, the buffalo that's tethered to that stake, it realizes it can't do what it needs to do, which is get its food into somewhere safe. And at that point, the man had heard the commotion of the tiger hauling at this buffalo and that tiger just made the decision, okay, that's something that I can kill, that's something I can drag very easily, and the man was dead very quickly. But for the family that are inside the house, hearing all of this going on, knowing that there is a predator out there in the dark, and that your husband is probably dead, it's just it's horrible and terrifying. That's a national park area, but at a good distance from the national park. This tiger must have been forced to leave there, and it's wandering about in this, this human landscape, and it's looking for food. And every day that passes that it doesn't eat, it's getting more and more desperate. When the authorities killed this man-eater, they discovered a significant clue. It was old, weak, and very thin. You can see in these photographs, teeth are all broken, these two incisors uh, are chipped, the bottom ones are almost completely gone. This is a tiger that would have had a very, very tough time catching natural prey. Gosh, really skinny, you can see his claws are, are gone. You know, this is a tiger on its, on its way out, on its last legs. This could explain why this tiger was driven into human territory and at last resorted to hunting human prey. But it doesn't explain the actions of the claw. This is the territory of Chitwan's current man-eating tigress, Ngarapothi. She hasn't killed a person for a year, but prior to that, in three years, she killed 10 people. So why was there so many killings in that period, and why did she stop? It could be that she was badly injured and she was having difficulty catching natural prey, and that's why she turned man-eater, and she's back to full health, and that's why she stopped. But maybe the question isn't why she started in the first place. Maybe the question is, is she going to turn man-eater again? Hunger must be part of what's driving the tigers in Chitwan, like Ngarapothi, to prey on people. But the Claw's home territory lies inside the park, and there's no evidence to suggest she's been sick or injured. So what could account for her hunger? This is a big national park. I'd have thought there was plenty of natural prey here. But the tiger's key prey, deer, may also be under threat. Poaching poses a problem for both tigers and their prey. Soldiers go out every night patrolling and they're looking for signs of poaching, looking for poachers themselves. And the vast majority of, of poachers are actually, the, they're after the tiger's prey, not the tiger itself. But to protect the tiger, you have to protect the things that it eats. People here know that killing a tiger is a serious crime. Although tigers are occasionally killed, most poachers in Chitwan are in pursuit of deer, and other ungulates. 
this is a really risky business. Not only did you run the chance of bumping into poachers who are armed, um, it's a wild environment. There are wild elephants here, rhinoceros, and out here somewhere in this very night, there's a man-eating tiger. We find no sign of poachers and very little prey. But locked inside the park headquarters, Bim shows me further evidence of poaching. Thank you. Holy smokes. Looks like they've confiscated stuff from a pirate ship. <laughs> so this is all stuff, traps, guns, things that have been confiscated. Yeah, by the, the army and the park management. And all these boxes contain the confiscated uh, wildlife parts, like skin, uh -huh. bones. Oh. So these are all oh. the... So this is just tiger bones? Yeah, those are all tiger bones. That so is the biggest obscene. Skull. How many tigers are in here? Yeah, quite a lot. Extinction in a box. Poaching has eradicated tigers from reserves just like Chitwan. And it could, it could happen here as well. That's just the really terrifying thing about it. Looks like parts of a rhino. Skins. This looks such like tiger. Rage. Such a waste. Such a waste. Despite the presence of the nightly patrols, it's obvious that poachers remain active in the park. But it's not just poaching that may be causing a decline in the number of deer and other animals here. Surprisingly, a harmless looking weed might also be part of the problem. So this is it all growing here? Yeah. Completely takes over. So Dan, since you've, you've been here, was this here 40 years ago? Yeah. yeah. And have you seen it take over? The mile a minute weed is not a native plant, but is growing rapidly here and may be killing off the other plant life. You know, this plant, it may be edible to some animals, but it's not as nutritious as the natural plants should be found here. But the trouble is, it doesn't belong here and it's completely taking over. And you think, okay, how can a plant like this have an effect on a tiger? Well, tigers are at the top of the pyramid. They are linked to everything that comes below them. The plants that are eaten by the herbivores and the herbivores that are eaten by the tigers. So this weed could be reducing the number of deer in the park. And if it is, I wonder if that's enough to force Ngarapothi to start hunting humans. Or is there something else at work? I'm heading out into the park on elephant back to see if prey is scarce near Ngarapothi's home territory. It's easy to feel safe riding so high up on elephants, but we find something that puts things into perspective. <laughs> got some scratch marks here left by a tiger which just gives you an indication of the power of their paws the sharpness of their claws that they can rake this incredibly hard wood and just make these huge scratches you can actually smell kind of catty smell as well not only is that just a way for a tiger to let other tigers know that this is my territory but if it's a female she's letting a male know that she's here that she's possibly available or not available to breed. Tigers aren't great climbers, but this is not a problem. A tiger could leap up here in about one bound. You'd think being on top of an elephant, you'd be pretty safe, but this tree is slightly higher than the height of an elephant. A tiger, if it wanted to, could probably leap clean over this elephant. Do you feel safe up here? Yeah, he said, I'm not scared. You're not scared? <laughs> right, I'm going to show you this. Have a look. Thank you. The mahout on this elephant, he looks absolutely cool as a cucumber. He's sitting right up there, doesn't feel in any way scared. 
there's a tie that in the grass if you can see it. <laughs> this is scared now. Huh? Okay. This footage was filmed just outside Kaziranga National Park in India. It's not something I want to experience myself here in Nepal. We press on and see game behaving strangely. <laughs> Not very safe. Gosh. <laughs> Tiger would attack them in a minute. Then it's clear why they're nervous. There's a tiger right here. Okay, we've got a tiger in the grass here, but it's really thick so we can't see it. Can you see it? I saw it, yeah, I couldn't see it on the camera though. I can see it on the camera. Oh, it's just sticking to the thickest part of the grass. Seeing this tiger entirely depends on how skittish it is, what its temperament is. Every single tiger is different. Some are bold, others are incredibly nervous. Okay, she's just disappeared off into the grass. She's just one of these tigers that doesn't want to be seen. She's on the moon. You've seen her? You can hear spotted deer calling. They've seen the tiger up ahead. Okay, we found a tiger, but she's acting really aggressively. And it's not because she's just an aggressive tiger. She's got two small cub cubs with her. I um, just got a glimpse of her in the grass. Uh, briefest glimpse of the cubs, but there's not much we can do. This grass could hide a herd of elephants, let alone a tiger and two small cubs. Huh? She's likely to be fiercely protective. Four years ago, when Ngarapothi started attacking humans, she may have been just as ferocious. She too had cubs. When she first killed the victim in 2008, uh, she had uh, three young cubs. Mm. Could this explain her apparent hunger and be what drove her to attack people? A tigress needs to eat five to six kilograms of meat every day. And if it's already hard for one big cat to find enough food, finding enough for three extra mouths must be almost impossible. Once the sub-adult cubs grow, uh, you know, dispersal is around two years of age. At that time, their size is same as the mother. So they need this equal amount of food. That's over 20 kilograms of meat a day. It doesn't matter what kind. What happens when a cub sees its mother behaving in a certain way? Surely if, if a mother is a man-eater, the cubs see that and just see that as a, as a source of food. 
Yeah. Later human kills were um, made by the young sub adult, one of our cubs. So, um, so it's yeah, it's possible that he you know he learned from the, the mother. So Angarapothi may have raised a new generation of man eaters. And what's terrifying is that it may be about to happen again. The claw now has a second litter of cubs. That's the worrying thing at the moment, that she's got these two cubs and that as they grow older, the pressure to feed them oh, yeah. mm -hmm. is going to become greater. Could the man-eating start again? I've got to see if Ngarapothi and her cubs are finding enough to eat. And to do that, I have to go back to her lair. I'm back in the Claws home territory. Which is about to cross over onto Ngarapothi's island. This is the edge of her territory. We can't go on elephant back because it's too far for elephants. We can't get a vehicle here, so we're going on. We're going on foot. Reluctantly. I don't know if entering the territory of a man-eating tiger on your bare feet is a particularly good idea. My running shoes on. I want to see if there's any sign of the tigress and her two cubs on my camera traps. There's a camera trap here. It's been figured 26 times. Um, there's a chance you get something interesting. You never know. The signs were promising, but there's not one shot of the elusive serial killer or her cubs. Um, okay. The longer that you leave these camera traps in position, the higher your chance of actually getting what you're after is. So we're gonna leave these, all of them, in position for as long as we can. I failed to capture the claw on film, even with my camera traps. But I'm not giving up yet. Because to understand every single case of man-eating, you have to get as much information yes. about the tiger that's doing it as possible, and getting photographs and moving images of them is, is right, important, yeah. so I hope, I hope we can help. Really yeah. I'm going to leave my camera traps here, set up in Angarapothi's territory. I really want to find out if it looks like she's catching enough prey to feed herself and her cubs. Or if it seems like she could turn man-eater again. I hope the cameras catch an image of her in the coming weeks. But for now, I have to head home. I leave Nepal with a heavy heart. But that wasn't quite the end of the story. A few weeks after returning home to Scotland, I receive a parcel from Bim. The claw's pug marks have been spotted around the camera trap. This is a card from the camera trap that I left on Garapothi's island. The Claws Island. It's interesting to see deer moving on to the island. And a good sign, I suppose, the fact that there are tigers living on the island and there is natural prey. Some more deer, actually, deer with young, looking very cautious. Can you imagine what's going through these animals' minds when they're moving through this thick grass? There could be a tiger anywhere. And it's not just deer caught on the camera trap. Okay, there's people wandering about. These are people that are having to come to this island to cut grass. It is probably the last place that these people want to go. Many of these guys probably knew the, the people that were killed by this tiger, and they probably know that she's still out here. Oh, that is her. 
that is definitely her. This is Ngarapothi, this is the claw. This is a tigress that has been responsible for possibly 10 people's deaths. This is a tiger that has probably only ever been seen by the people that she's killed. And we've got her. This fleeting glimpse could be the very first image of the claw on film. And even though her face is hidden, the shot does reveal crucial evidence. She doesn't look like some big, impressive tiger. She looks like a, a fairly skinny animal. She looks a bit like a tiger that's down on her luck. She's carrying, you can see she's got a fawn in her mouth. Her meal for the night. And Garapothi is currently feeding two growing cubs that will soon be almost as big as she is. If this small deer is a typical kill, it doesn't look like enough food for all three of them. It was at this point, with her previous litter, that the claw turned to man-eating. And I'm just wondering if this is a desperate, hungry tigress that's going to turn to man-eating again. She hunts in a small refuge meant to keep her from man. But even here, they come. And if she turns on them, not in fear or cruelty, but in desperation, she loses the one thing she needs more than their meat, their help. tracking down the world's top predators. I know how they act, and have rarely felt threatened before. But now, there's a deadly difference. Animals that used to chase game are hunting humans. These are some of nature's biggest mysteries. To solve them, I'll put myself onto the trail of the managers. in Nepal in search of a serial killer. A tigress that's killed at least 10 people in the last four years. Her name is Ngarapothi, which means the claw. This morning I'm heading to Chitwan National Park. This one is buying the tickets for the bus journey. The park is home to around 125 of Nepal's Bengal tigers. It's also home to Ngarapothi. So, I'm on my way. At best, Chitwan National Park is seven hours away by bus. And it's going to be a pretty long journey. 45 minutes outside Kathmandu and we've just hit this huge traffic jam. Slip slight problem and um, this is a different bus. Because of the traffic jam, um, it seemed to be taking forever, so we, we got out and had a cup of tea. It seemed the right thing to do at the time, but then the traffic started moving. We thought it'll only move. 10, 15 yards, and it's moved maybe about 10 or 15 miles. So, just hopped on this bus and hoping that this bus is moving faster than our bus and we can be reunited with our bags and our passports. I'm not sure whether things have got better or worse. Our bus stopped in front of us, so we got off one bus to run and catch up with our own bus, but we didn't quite make it. Finally, I'm reunited with my original bus, and my cameras. I'm heading for the Terai, the hot lowlands of Nepal, on the border with India. In the past, 
Tigers roamed this whole region. Nepal was once home to some of the highest densities of tigers on the Indian subcontinent. Like elsewhere in Asia, tigers have long been a sacred symbol here. I climbed up the tree, it was about 40 feet, you just look back and say, keep eating. I start licking the body and it's tearing of flesh. Chewing all the bone like oh, we, we're chewing like carrot, yeah. yeah, very crunchy. I was so scared, and I feel every second my tree is getting one foot short, <laughs> <laughs> dropping all the time, you know. <laughs> I can't imagine being so close to a man eating tiger, and Chitwan's current man eater, the claw, is somewhere in this park right now. I've filmed tigers before yeah. in India and in Russia mm -hmm. and in Bhutan. Yeah. But this is the first place that I've come to where there is a problem with man-eating, where there is a tiger that is yeah. recently killed and eaten someone. Yeah. It just makes me think very differently about these, these tigers in this place. Humans are not natural prey for tigers. There must be a reason why some of the tigers in Chitwan, including in Garapothi, are behaving unnaturally and hunting people. And in Garapothi has got very good at it. But where they are revered, they're also feared. It's estimated there could be fewer than 200 Bengal tigers left in Nepal. You just look out at this landscape. There's not a square inch of this that hasn't been touched by the hand of man. One time, not that long ago, this would have been thick jungle. It would have been a home for the tiger. Today, this is a place where tigers can't live. During the 1950s, a government program moved thousands of new people into this area of southern Nepal, and the forests were replaced by farmland. As the human population grew, the number of tigers fell. In 1973, the Nepalese government established Chitwan National Park to try and save the country's tiger population. And after several dusty hours by bus, I finally arrived here. At almost 1,000 square kilometers, Chitwan seems like ideal tiger territory. It looks amazing. It smells amazing. And you'd think that tigers living somewhere like this, there'd be no controversy, no conflict. But since the 1970s, since Chitwan first opened, 103 people have been killed by tigers. The most recent death was just a year ago. Something unusual is happening in Chitwan. Within minutes of arriving, I'm under attack from a rogue wild elephant nicknamed Valentino. Valentino has killed two men in the last year. It seems it's not just the tigers that pose a threat to people here. My guide in Chetuan is Dan Bahadur. He's been a tiger tracker here since the park first opened and has more than 40 years experience. Can't tell whether he's in love or whether he's annoyed. During his career, Dan has been involved in capturing man-eating tigers, and he's witnessed the carnage firsthand. I've seen actually the tigers dragging humans. You body. are kidding me! But the human body was eaten half. Half. Uh -huh. Suddenly, the tiger was there. 
He was very angry with us. Mm -hmm. He came like, ah! 